I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm chatting with Stephanie Hafferty. Amongst other things, Stephanie is a writer, speaker, long-time champion of No Dig Gardening, a food-growing expert and a talented chef. And I think we're very lucky that she's taken time out to share some brilliant tips with us this week. The knowledge comes thick and fast in this episode, so you may want to grab a pen and paper before you begin listening. I started by asking Steph to describe in her own words her work and her areas of expertise. Ah, right. Okay, yes. So I work as, um, in various things, I work as a no-dig kitchen gardener. And also I'm a garden and food writer and I specialise in plant based recipes almost entirely made from things that you can actually grow in the UK. So I wouldn't have tofu in because I can't grow soybeans. I'd use something that you actually can grow. So that's broadly what I do. I work as a consultant as well. I advise people with setting up um, no dig gardens. And um, I'm a actually in normal times, I'm a speaker. I go around teaching people and I give talks at um, the RHS shows and things like that. So it's sort of multifaceted. And my areas of expertise really, I think, is growing food year round using no dig methods and particularly in normal size spaces. So here I'm in a ex council house in Somerset. And I've got a front garden, a back garden and an allotment. So although I've got 12 years experience of growing um, in market gardens of different sizes and I've run kitchen gardens on private estates, I'm particularly interested in growing food in normal gardens, the kind of things that most of us have that are lucky enough to have a garden. Which is excellent because I thought today we would talk about some kind of seasonal nuts and bolts um, questions that people might have. Um, but out of interest, before I get onto those, what do you use as a tofu alternative? Um, actually, if I want tofu, I have tofu. Um, I, <laughs> Fair enough, I'm not yeah. like in my real life, yeah. <laughs> um, but for when I'm when I'm coming up with recipes, so I use tofu as because it's a protein. Um, I would use. Uh, beans primarily so I grow different kinds of drying beans particularly keen on czar and um, gigantes which are two different sizes of white beans they grow really really well in our climate particularly czar beans czar beans are a type of runner bean and runner beans grow in the UK really well Um, and so they are so useful for so many different things you can use them to make a hummus, you can use them in soups, stews, just cook them and put them in salads. The flavour is fantastic. Um, yeah, they're just some of my favourite things. And the brilliant thing about growing drying beans, so beans for drying, is I recommend everybody does it next year if they can, is you once you've got them going, you put them in the ground in May, depending on where your last when your last frost date is. And then once they get going, that's it. You leave them and you've got to keep your eye on them. If it's dry weather, they might want some water, but they'll just grow and they'll flower and they'll produce the pods and the pods will get fat. And then the pods will hopefully, if we've got a dry autumn, dry on the bean frame. And that's it. So at a time of year when you're having to side shoot tomatoes and pick all your fruit and all in a really busy summer time, these beans, they just keep growing Mm. and they do their thing. It is great. And then when things are starting to calm down a bit in the garden, that's when you're harvesting them, drying them, which is easy. You can do it on windowsills. If they haven't dried in their pods, I open them into, you know, those blue plastic trays you get from the greengrocer Mm -hmm. because with the holes in. Yeah. Put them in those because it's lots of holes. So the air circulates for a few weeks. And when they're dry, stick them in a jam jar in the cupboard. Off you go. And then soak them overnight and cook for about half an hour to make them into edible beans again they're just 
brilliant, absolutely wonderful. Loads and loads of different varieties I grow, all kinds of funky colours as well, and ones that look um, that are black and white and different flavours and different shapes. But these two are my favourite. Mm, that sounds fantastic. Just what I like is a low maintenance veg. But talking of beans, yeah. um, I've just harvested broad beans and I don't actually know what to do with them. Have you got any suggestions? Uh, how big are they? Are they little ones or have they got fat? I've got both. All oh, right. Little ones I would um, steam or boil and just eat like peas. Um, they're very sweet and delicious, lovely in salads as well. So if, what I like to do is if I'm shelling beans or peas is um listen to a podcast or um a story book what are they called you know <laughs> books where people audio books, yeah. Got, audio book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jack and ori yeah. right yeah i'm jack and ori on and then do the lot and then cook them all together and then you've got some for whatever you're having for your meal that day and then to have a bowl of them in the fridge is great because you can throw them in salads or just nibble them. And um, if you've done loads, then some can pop in the freezer for another day. Mm. If they're the big fat ones yeah. with the really hard skin, cook those. And then you get your storybook back on again or your <laughs> podcast and split the, um, sh- you squeeze them and they, the middle bit will shoot out very obligingly from the horrible hard case um which isn't so you can just about eat it but it's a bit too chewy and then the lovely tender insides even if they've got really big and flowery fantastic for making um hummus based dishes with Mm -hmm. really really good yeah yeah okay cool thank you for that um and the other problem that I'm facing myself at the moment is that I didn't plan my veg plot at all so now I've got a load of lettuces that are mature I don't right. want them to bolt. Is there anything I can do, to, or does it depend on what sort they are? Well, it depends also how big they are and at what stage they're thinking their life is at. If you if you grow, I usually grow lettuce for like bowls of salad, um, and I'm from being quite small, I'm picking the outer leaves uh, about once a week of, from each plant. And that keeps the lettuce um, in a kind of adolescent state for much longer, for weeks and weeks and weeks. So you can keep picking from the same plant and it will gradually rise up up as if it's bolting, but you can still crop from it. But if yours have been sort of sitting there thinking, I'm going to become a parent now, I'm loving life, um, it might not be possible to keep them going. You might be better off um, re-sowing. But one brilliant thing is if you've got too much lettuce and, frankly, you're bored witless with just eating leaves, really good roasted. Oh, my goodness. I grow hearting lettuce just to roast it. Wow. And you can barbecue it. My God, I have no idea. Oh, and you want that kind of charredness around the edges that really makes food taste so yummy sometimes really really delicious and how you flavor it is entirely up to you and what mood you're in so you can roast them with slivers of garlic stuck between the leaves different herbs you can use balsamic vinegar um, lemon and coriander and dill those sorts of zingy flavors cook it with basil whatever you fancy really nice and depending on the size of your lettuce you'd either quarter them or halve them I grow some which are quite small and they're halved and then the big ones, they get quartered. And easy to do if you're making like a dinner, you've got things in the oven, you just shove them in with everything else. Takes about 20 minutes, depending on the size, 20 to 30 minutes. Yum. Really good. You'll enjoy it, I'm sure. I'm new talking to you. It's going to make me feel hungry. (laughs) (laughs) So you spoke then about picking the leaves to to keep them in the adolescent state. I just want to double check. You said pick from the outside. The outer leaves, yes, is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You, want, you want to keep the heart leaves intact. So um, the heart leaves are the ones that are going to keep growing and reproducing uh, or producing more leaves. So at this time of year, one lettuce plant will produce five to seven leaves a week, approximately. So it also gives you an idea of how many lettuce plants you need to have, um, you know, you 
wouldn't want 30 plants if there was just two of you. If you're getting seven leaves off each plant in a week, you'd, that would be a bit crazy. Um, and yeah, you just pick them. What I like to do is have some which are picked, say, on a Monday. Others I'll pick on the Wednesday. Others I'll pick on the Friday. So they're kind of I just move along the bed that way rather than picking them all in one go. Although they do last about a week in the fridge pick this way it's better to do it with your fingers and a kind of pushing down movement against the stalk as you take the leaf off that's nicer for the plant than cutting it with a knife it really helps and also any leaves that are that have been nibbled by something or have just got a bit old get those off and chuck them in the compost at the same time and that reduces habitat for slugs so you're less likely to serve slug with your salad <laughs> excellent that's a good tip nobody wants that um, I did that once actually oh. uh, by mistake I when I, I ran a kitchen garden for um some quite famous people and they I delivered their salad for the weekend I'd gone home for the weekend and they didn't rinse the salad very well. Uh -oh. And <laughs> apparently if you bite on a slug, oh. even cleaning your tongue with toothpaste doesn't help. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ooh, God. so it's always worth washing it. Yes, I mean, to be fair, we've all been there. And actually washing <laughs> veg is quite a, it's quite a difficult and time-consuming thing, I find, because there's quite often something lurking on there. So, yeah, yeah it is a full-time <laughs> full <-time> job. <laughs> um so thinking about um, things that might bolt, do you have any rules about when to sow them to stop them bolting? Are there any kind of tips for that? Well, it very much depends on what the plant is. So things like lettuce, that it, in the winter they'll bolt slow, more slowly. The, the ones that I put in my polytunnel, I sow them in September. I plant them in October. And once they start cropping, which is usually by the end of the year, it very much depends on the weather, um, then they'll keep going till May or even June because there's less light and things and it's just a slower time of year. Um, and also you can get different varieties of a specific plant which works at other times, such as Florence fennel, which I grow year round, even though you're not supposed to be able to, um, it, you can. And so... The summer solstice is an important one for Florence fennel. And if you're sowing in the spring before the summer solstice, you need to get a slow bolting Florence fennel variety. And if you're sowing after the summer solstice, then practically all of them will be fine. And if you're sowing in the autumn for a winter harvest, um, I found Finale and Solaris work really well, but they're both F1 hybrids. And that's when an F1 hybrid obviously is nothing to do with GMO. There's sometimes people get a bit confused about that. Sometimes an F1 hybrid will enable you to grow something at a time of year when it is more difficult to grow an open pollinated seed. Although Zeta Fina is good in the winter as well. And that is an open pollinated one. So it really I mean, I, I would be here forever going through all the yeah, different sure. type of plants. But for example, at the moment, Dill and coriander mostly will bolt because it's their time of year. It's to do with the length of the day and the temperature. And so I want both of them at this time of year because of the vegetables that I'm growing, particularly cucumbers with dill is just amazing. So I will grow, sow those and use it more as a kind of catch crop. I'm not expecting a big plant that will last ages. I'll sow them more thickly and cut them really like um, micro leaves. So I've got the herb. I'm using the herb. It just uses a bit more seed, but I save a lot of my seed from those. So it's all free now anyway. And um, then you've got those herbs to use while you want. And in August, I, I will start sowing them for plants and then they'll produce plants and I won't need quite so many. Yeah. So thinking about things that sometimes that could f flower, is it all right to eat things like rocket and mustard greens, even if they flower? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And actually, I think that's one of the pleasures of growing your own is being able to eat the bolting parts that you can't get in shops. So things like rocket flowers, they're nice on salad. Um, mustard green shoots 
I mean, you can eat those raw. I like snacking on them. Or you can steam them. You can put them in stir fry. The flavor's amazing. They're still spicy. And you've just got all this free food. And some things you wouldn't, I mean, actually bolting lettuce, the shoots of that, they're, it's bitter. It's just not nice. But bolting brassicas taste fantastic. And I try and have some bolting as much as possible in the garden and in the polytunnel year round because the flowers bring in beneficial predators. So what I'm constantly trying to do is build up a good, healthy environment where I've got parasitic wasps, regular wasps, hoverflies, ladybirds, insects like that, which are going to eat my bugs for me here and letting some plants bolt. It, the flowers are the right kind to bring these insects in. So you get the food yourself and also you're helping yourself out by creating a, a richer environment. Yeah. So you talked about dill as a catch crop. Is there anything else that you can bung in that's a good quick filler for gaps that At we this might make? time of year, um, you can direct sow lettuce. I mean, it depends if you want to die. I mostly grow things in modules, but you can... Um, so sort of quick growing catch crops. Radish is not so good at this time of year because of flea beetle. But if you've got Enviromesh, you can put radish underneath that, though some of the varieties do sort of bolt quite a bit. Um, I would generally, it's things like the herbs at this time of year. And also what I really like is direct sowing pak choy, which again needs to be under Enviromesh because of bugs, things like flea beetle. But if you direct sow it and it grows quite close together then it you get these loads of little baby pack choys which are just so you can cut like every other one out and eat them while they're small and then they'll grow on and you get the next lot to eat a bit bigger and you should sort of say take every other one again and then the ones left will get even bigger do you see what I mean? so you you've just done one long sowing but you'll get harvesting at different sizes and they'll keep going for quite a while and pak choy is just you know that's another good summer one you can roast it you can steam it you can eat it raw and if it bolts it's really good for wildlife too okay um so, so if we kind of had a glut which i'm imagining we're coming up to courgette glut time for a lot of people ah, yes. and also i another one that i'm going to have a lot of on my hands and and if i offer it to people they will go oh no i've got loads of that is kale is there anything we can do with gluts of courgettes or kale um if you've got a dehydrator they both dehydrate really well um, I slice courgettes and take the stem out of the kale and I've got an electric dehydrator so I dry it in there and that's really good in the winter you can just chuck it into stocks and soups and stews and it adds vitamins and flavor and a bit of different texture uh, they all both well courgettes freeze really well particularly if you've roasted them first um, kale I would shred it Put it in a bowl, add a little bit of oil, a little bit of salt, wiggle it about with your fingers, put it in an oven at about 180 degrees Fahrenheit to 200. Um, for about 10 to 12 minutes, halfway through, wiggle it about with a spatula and you'll get kale crisps and just eat them all then because they're really, really good. <laughs> and they're, but they're lovely as well to have. You can put them on top of things. Um there's lots and lots of pickles and chutneys and things you can make out of courgettes. So there's that kind of preserving too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what's the Bible for preserving food? I, I think perhaps your books might cover some of this. I certainly, my books certainly do have various things that you can do with um, kale and courgettes and other gluts. I don't cover... Um, I do uh, some of the aspects of preserving, but the whole canning side of it, because there's so many regulations and it depends which part of the world you're in as well, what mm. your regulations are. I don't cover that in as much depth in my book. So I would then recommend always if you're using making something to preserve for winter, um, like a chutney or I've got a water bath canner, so I can a lot of food in glass jars. Um, I would always use a recipe that comes from a source you know is reliable. 
because um, the side effects can be botulism, which is a bit grim. Oh, yeah. no. So, don't, so don't have like a dodgy recipe off the Internet <laughs> that you're not you're not sure who has written it. No, fair enough. That's a very good point. I always feel like canning is a bit of a dark art and a, maybe a step too far for me. But who knows? Dehydrator sounds good. Dehydrators are great. And I have a big one, but you can get smaller ones for 30 to 50 pounds, which are perfectly fine. I de- have the best thing for a dehydrator is tomatoes mm. because oh, yeah. wow. they're real and then you've got and that once you've dehydrated them again it's so easy to just store in glass jars and you get that wonderful tomato flavor then all winter and you're not having to run obviously you're running electricity while you're actually dehydrating it but then the storage is off grid um mm. within your house until you use it and, oh, you could soak them and add them to anything. They're just so nice. One thing I never do is store it in olive oil, um, right. them in olive oil, because oh, I don't have this. It's a bit risky. So although people have been doing it for centuries, you really have to know what you're doing. And, um, I, yeah, I prefer dehydrating and then rehydrating and adding oil when I'm going to be using them, not storing it that way. Right. That's a good tip. Botulism risks again. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't want... Definitely don't want that, no. No. <laughs> but things like pickles and stuff, where you're using vinegars and salt, they're preservatives. Mm-hmm. Things like jams, where you're using sugar, that's a preservative. So they last longer. And, you know, we've traditionally done that for a very long time. There's some great books out there and um, different resources with lots of different recipes for storing things in jars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's um, tomato sound divine. So oh, that's so one. good. Yeah. Um, I always think that when I've, I, if I work in a veg garden, and I have to confess, it's not my forte, uh, but I have done it, and I always feel like actually the harvesting and the deadheading, if you know, if you've got edible flowers and things, is actually one of the most time-consuming jobs. And I think people quite often forget about it when they're planning a garden. So if you had kind of an average allotment size plot in the UK. How long would you anticipate spending on kind of harvesting and deadheading at each day at this time of year? Um, well, I'm not there every day, so it, def- it isn't an everyday job. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just do it once a week because that's the only time they can get there. Yeah. Um, I mean, at this time of year, the things I'm harvesting now are my shallots and my onions. And so the actual harvesting part is fairly quick. And you feel really good because, like, hey, I'm bringing in the harvest. Mm. And then, um, but then I've always got trays of things which are going to go in next. So my onions, when I harvest those, I'm going to be planting radicchios and chicories into that bed straight away so that the next harvest is coming on. Well, that will be harvested in the autumn and over winter. Um, so it, but it is something to consider is how much time If you've got things like courgettes and you've planted too many courgette plants, which is one of the things I'm quite good at, and that can take ages to harvest, don't worry if you don't want all the courgettes at that time and your neighbours will hate you if you try to give them to them. It's sort of about being nice to yourself. So if you have, you know, you only can go to your plot once a week and some of your courgettes are turning into monsters, they need taking off the plant. So the plant keeps producing the same with French beans. They, you need to harvest the, the, re, the ones that are ready in order for the plant to keep producing. But if you don't want all of them and you can't find a home for them and you, there isn't a food bank that can take them and all of those things, don't feel bad about putting them in the compost because that is producing food for your next harvest. So, you know, I think it's it's about being conscious of what you're able to do in your space with the time that you've got and um, I mean I went a bit mad the other earlier this year I think it was to do with the whole lockdown thing and it was like I will feed the nation (laughs) and I had spare tomato plants and I put them in a bed in my front garden growed and I've got 49 tomato oh plants my in my polytunnel. That's just in the polytunnel. <laughs> what, why I thought I had to rescue these, I clearly do not know. But, um, and I was looking at them the other day thinking, well, I need this bed. This, has got the, this is where I'm putting my salad. <laughs> so I, I had to say to myself, well, actually, this is really good that they've grown really big and leafy because 
there's even more of them to put in the compost. <laughs> I, had to, I had to get rid of them a lot. So we all do daft stuff and you get swept along with the moment. And um, I think if you realise that you've planted 10 courgette plants for a family of four, there's nothing wrong with choosing the best four and getting rid of the other six. Yeah. The garden goddess doesn't descend and go point the finger at you. <laughs> you just have to Composting be is good. Just think of it as a kind of unusual green manure yes. instead. Yes, that is a very good point. I'm not very good at plant euthanasia, so I tend to no. have everything, even the straggly ones, get potted up. And then I've got far too many, but it's ridiculous. Um, so that yeah, And then you can't point. look after the healthy ones no. properly, I find, no, that's when I true. do that. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I've been there and done that as well. I was going to say, thinking about things kind of going over and getting too big. And I I do wonder, especially kind of having read your books and talking to you, whether perhaps we are a little bit fussy or a little bit quick to kind of follow the rules and chuck things on the compost just because we think they've gone past you know, the, the, what is traditionally seen as their best. Um, can you think of anything in particular? Like, obviously, we've spoken about the, the kind of things like rocket, that flower, but can you think of anything else where people kind of, it's always been repeated like, oh, you can't eat a beetroot that's bigger than a golf ball size, or you can't eat this. Can you think of any veg where we quite often, you know, tend to waste it when we really could be eating it? Um, yeah, well, actually, beetroot is a classic example because I've I like eating beetroot raw, and even quite big ones are still really juicy and tender, raw. So that is, and also the beetroot leaves. People generally rip off the leaves and chuck them in the compost, but they're a really delicious food in themselves. I think one of the big ones is people not realizing that you can eat um, things like bolting purple sprouting broccoli or Brussels sprouts. So in the spring, in the hungry gap, which is usually end of April, May time here, um, when things like your overwintered black brassicas are going into flower, the amount of times, I mean, some people think if they eat it, they'll get ill. Mm. You know, you can eat the whole, whole plant. You can even eat the stem. If you think of a purple sprouting broccoli plant and you've got all the shoots coming off. Now, you wouldn't want to just, like, take a bite out of the stem because your teeth would probably stay in there. <laughs> but if you cut it and peel off the outer bit, the inner part is quite sweet and juicy. Mm. I mean, it's a bit of a palaver. You probably would only do it if you didn't have much greenery, but it is totally edible. I use broccoli stem um, in as, like, a base for a soup. Once it's pureed down, it's fine. It's just added green, so, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also you can use them and like the, the stalky parts of kale leaves that isn't really that easy to digest. If you're making a vegetable stock that you're going to strain, that's good in there. Um, I don't I haven't actually tried whizzing up the stalky parts of kale. Maybe I'll give it a go one day and see mm. if that works. Yeah. Um, I mean, some things you obviously would discard. You like the leaves of rhubarb, because if you didn't, you'd get very ill. Um yeah, and also things that have had a bit of a nibble out of them. I just cut that bit out with a knife because, I mean, it's, I, you can always, well, it's bound to be yummy because something's already had, a, I mean, if it was a rat bite, I don't think I would, you know, but enough, I'm right. talking about, you know, if a wasp has had a bit of a nibble at your green gauges or something like that. Yeah. You know, there's, I think one of the lovely things about growing your own as well is you will eat rocket which has got flea beetle holes and because it's your rocket and you love it and it's still tasty just because you couldn't sell it doesn't mean it's not something wonderful to have and um, also you know things like uh, spring onions you can use all of the green leeks use all of the green there the green is often one of the best parts and people really look down on it they just like only use the white shaft but the whole of the plant is really delicious to eat it just makes I think because when you've gone to all the trouble of growing it yourself you want to make the most out of all of the, your lovely plant mm. I've done I, I do the same thing with spring onions now I never used to but now I eat the green right up to the you know almost to the tip but I used to yeah. just use a white bit and throw it away I mean god it's madness uh, you know you can tell we've been brought up with an abundance of easy to get hold of food because totally. I think quite a wasteful kind of attitude to food. Well, I think we've been encouraged to have it as well. well That's yeah, the thing. And if true. all you've ever seen is trimmed um, 
spring onion then that in your mind is only going to be the edible part mm. until you've learned so yeah it's um it's a just it is a learning thing I think for most people there's always something that you're not quite sure how it's supposed to look when you're growing it one brilliant thing about spring onions which I really like is obviously you can use them like one would a spring onion but if you get I get some which are bunching onions which tend to be very long and straight and they're really good for stir fries I eat a lot of stir mm, fries yeah but if you get the ones like white lisbon which can form a bulb as well mm. because I multi-sow them which so I've got modules which are about two or three centimeters by two or three centimeters little modules stuck together in a tray and I'll put six seeds of spring onions in each module grow them like that so it looks like little little grass modules and then pop those in the ground because that's really handy because you've got them ready then you can pop them around things such as if you're planting out winter brassicas which you have to put quite far apart because they get really big and you've got all that space with not much going on spring onions are great between there because they'll grow as your brassicas are getting established and by the time you've cropped them the brassicas will be really big and taking over the, the bed but if you let them get fat then you can use them like onions as well like a regular onion so it's you know the same crop and you're just using it in different ways that's really handy as well over winter when I've often eaten all my onions that I've grown supply the spring onions I've got going in the garden then start producing onions which I use mm, you know for everything no, yeah so it's sort of looking at things and thinking okay I can actually use you like an onion even though you're called a spring onion <laughs> yeah that's a really good tip because I've yeah 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 um I, I mean I can't get enough of onions so I'll oh, nice. definitely be employing that yeah I'm a bit um, obsessed myself <laughs> Uh, so I've got a question actually from somebody who listens and is a Patreon subscriber um, and her name is Amanda Writer, and she said she's been growing squash this year for the first time um, they're in very large pots in the greenhouse and her butternut squash has a number of female flowers and is doing okay but she seems to have 95% male fly- flowers on her other two varieties which are curry and honey boat Ooh. can she do anything to improve her chances of getting squash? Um, I've not come across that one before. That's a new one. I mean, maybe then, maybe it's a bit hot in the greenhouse and they might be a bit stressed because usually squash are grown outside. So I would, if they're in pots, if they're movable, I'd put them outside and just see if that helps. Because also you'll get better insect pollination outside than indoors. And, um, but also, I mean, I would make sure that they're properly watered. I've not come across 90% male flowers. It'd be interesting to know where the seeds were from, um, who supplied it as well, because quite often um, things that go a bit wrong for home gardeners, it can be quite old seed or that kind of thing. So it's not necessarily something the gardener's done wrong. It could be somewhere further back in the seed process. Obviously, one of my things with squash is I would never, ever grow squash from home saved seed or a store bought fruit. Or if you go to a seed swap and you see people doing little packets of squash seeds, which they've saved themselves. I, I always get it from a supplier that I feel confident with because squash and all of that family are very very promiscuous with cross-pollination so they will cross-pollinate with courgettes they'll cross-pollinate with inedible gourds they can cross-pollinate with wild squash and so the chances of you getting what you're actually hoping for are quite small and at best you might you might get what you were hoping for you might get some kind of weird hybrid that's quite interesting but there's also all cucurbits have a toxin in them and back in the day they were all really bitter tasting and this toxin was to stop beasties coming and eating them and this has been bred out by people over the years so that we've got these delicious vegetables to eat and in the cross-pollination it can trigger this latent gene I'm probably explaining this quite badly but um, it can trigger this latent gene which can make a bitter tasting fruit which is toxic 
and causes horrible food poisoning. So it's one of those things where I am passionately into seed saving. I think that is so important. But there are some things where you've really got to be careful if you want to know how to save squash seed properly so that you are going to get what you want and it's not going to cross pollinate it with anything. Um, Real Seeds very generously on their website have explanations of how to do it and various other plants. And also they take so long to grow that I'd rather know in, you know, April, May when I'm sowing the thing that actually in October I'm going to get something that will store well over winter and that's great to eat. It's not like sowing a lettuce variety that you don't like because they're fairly quick to grow. Yeah, and they don't take up as much space. You know, it's not such an investment either, is it? And they're not likely to poison you either, really. No, no. <laughs> Which is well, always nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't need that. No. Um, well, Steph, you are amazing. I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, and I really thank you for your knowledge, but I do need to probably let you go at some point. Could you finish maybe by telling people where they can find you and um, you know where, what books you've got and where they could get hold of those? Okay, so my books are No Dig Organic Home and Garden and The Creative Kitchen. So the first one is about No Dig Gardening and also there's recipes in there for things you can eat and um, things you can make, you know, garden potions for feeding plants and stuff. And The Creative Kitchen is entirely recipes, all plant-based recipes and as well as things that you can eat. And I, in it, I also have, you know, if I'm making a recipe and I'm suggesting some vegetables, I put in other vegetables you can use at different times of year. So it's, they're all adaptable. So and those are available f- from me on my website, which is stephaniehafferty.co.uk. And at the moment, I've got a special offer if you buy two of them. They're discounted. And they're also for sale on um, the usual online um, websites. And um, also I'm writing a book at the moment called No Dig Year Round Harvests, which comes out in February next year. And that is about growing your own year round in smaller spaces um, with lots of the things that I've learnt growing vegetables in my garden for 30 odd years. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to come back on in February when your book's released. I would released. be delighted. Thank you. That would be that great. Would be awesome. Yeah, I'm looking. That one's. Yeah, I've got garden projects and things in that as well. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that coming out. And I can't wait for the new book. As you know, I'm a tough judge of gardening books, but I do have Steph's, and I've even bought copies as presents for other people. They're so good. A huge thank you to Steph for taking part in the interview. Links to her website are in the show notes. And thanks to you for listening. I'll leave you with Dr Ian Bedford talking about a creature that, even if you love wildlife, you may not be too keen to spot in your garden. Over the last few years, we've been told by the UK's Plant Health Department to be on the lookout for Asian hornets and to report any sightings. The Asian hornet is a non-native invasive species that originates from Asia, but more recently has been spreading to new locations. In 2004, it first arrived in France, and this year, significant numbers have already been found in Jersey. Despite three confirmed sightings in the UK last year, it has not yet become established. So what makes the Asian hornet such a concern for us? Well, unlike the European hornet, which is an integral part of our native wildlife, the Asian hornet is an aggressive predator that poses a significant threat to many of our pollinating insect species, in particular the honeybee. Our pollinators are already in serious decline, so an invasion of this hornet species will only make things worse. Unfortunately, some newspapers have been publishing unhelpful and misleading articles, aimed to scaremonger rather than sensibly inform readers what they can do to help. The best way we can help is not to worry about hornets, but to make sure we can spot the difference between the Asian hornet and our native European species. Asian hornets are slightly smaller than the European species. Their bodies are dark brown or black, with just one yellow band on the fourth body segment, and they also have yellow legs. 
The European hornet has a mostly yellow body, with thin black markings between the body segments, and a row of black dots down each side of its back. Despite their size, hornets are not really aggressive to us unless they feel threatened. So it's wise not to approach a hornet's nest or to disturb it. Instead, it makes sense to observe hornets from a distance, perhaps when they visit a pond or bird bath to drink. If you think you've seen an Asian hornet, then take note of the location and also the direction it flies off in as this may help in locating a nest. Then either report the sighting to your local plant health inspector or by using the online form. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.